It says here you may have spotted our two final guests here already, but they're getting ready right now. So you probably haven't yet, but you will oh. shortly. I love it. At any rate, our last reader is actually two readers. One is the author of several books, including Unforgettable, Harrowing Futures, Horrors, and Dark Humor, which won a silver prize at the two, uh, 2012 Midwest Book Awards. His next novel, Logan's Journey, is co-authored with Logan's run author, William F. No Nolan, is slated for a 2014 publication. A Milwaukee native, he lives in Evanston, Illinois, with his wife, Heather, and their rescued uh, greyhound, Sam. The other is a first-time author and a founder of Vite Radio Theater, which produces original old-time radio shows. He's also a fill-in uh, fill musical show host and voiceover man for WJOB AM 1230 in Hammond, Indiana. A native of the region, he lives in Munster, Indiana with his wife, Lori, and their cat, Tippecanoe. And a dog, Tyler, too. Together, they've written the new novel, Fit for a Frankenstein. So please welcome Paul McComas and Greg Stark. enough of that. Um, <laughs> so yeah, Paul and Greg, and uh, thank you, Phil, thank you, Andrew, thank you, everyone, for staying to the, uh, to the end here. What a, great, what a great lineup. The pressure is definitely on. Um, our novella, Fit for a Frankenstein, was written because, you see, the fourth Universal Pictures Frankenstein movie, The Ghost of Frankenstein, released in 1942, begins with the destruction of the castle of Dr. Frankenstein in the village of Frankenstein. The monster and his familiar, Igor, seen here and also here, <laughs> played by Bela Lugosi originally, uh, flee the area. The monster has just been uh, released from his encasement in, in a block of dried sulfur, so he's this like sickly white color. His whole outfit is caked in sickly white sulfur. And they flee Frankenstein village, and Igor says, we go to this area. We see, we see the second son of Frankenstein. He makes you stronger. There's a fade out. It's about 12 minutes into the movie. And then there's a fade in. And they are 30 kilometers away in this area. And the monster is wearing a brand new suit. <laughs> As writers, we like to address the most important issues of our time. And this wardrobe continuity issue from 1942, <laughs> the fourth movie in the Universal Frankenstein series, seemed to fit the bill. Because um, it doesn't always have to be about changing the world, does it? <laughs> Halloween. We're just extending it a little bit longer, and I want to give a shout out here to Leonard J. Cole, the horror uh, film scholar who's writing about this continuity error, kind of forced the issue for us and say, we're like, yeah, we've noticed that before, but we've never really thought about it, let alone tried to solve it. So this novella tells the story of what happens, how they get from one fictitious Bavarian town to another, <laughs> and how the monster is freed of his tunic and black slacks and comes to take possession of this beautiful, tailored black suit. <laughs> um, Igor Lugosi, starrette, is uh, a hanging survivor. He was executed, but he didn't die, so he's got a broken neck. And he's got a thick Hungarian accent, because again, it's Lugosi. And when we decided to put him together with this tailor, we wanted the tailor character to be as different from Igor as, as was humanly possible. Um, and, and we thought of a number of different possible actors to, to pattern him after. But ultimately, we decided on David Hyde Pierce. <laughs> Niles Crane of TV's Frasier Show. 
because uh, who could be more different from Igor, the hanging survivor and pathological killer, and who could be more flustered and flummoxed by him than one Niles Crane. So this struggling Bavarian tailor, Klaus Hauchschmidt, is uh, based upon Niles, and I just need to get the thimble and then we're good to go. <laughs> So this is the arrival of Igor at the tailor shop to try and secure the suit. Well, the monster's not in this scene. He's the 800-pound gorilla. He's, you know, he's what the scene is all about, right? Right, right. Okay. Klaus Hauptschmidt moved briskly down the steps from his second-story living quarters to the ground floor, through the back work area of his shop, and then stepped out from behind the curtains and up to the front counter. Sir, may I help? Hell was as far as he got. Appropriate, thought Klaus with a chill, for surely hell itself must have spawned the grinning creature now standing before him. You have Schmidt, the tailor? The voice was right, like broken fingernails on sandpaper. Klaus steadied himself. I am. You the best tailor in Kockstadt? I am. Also the only tailor in Kockstadt. His unseemly visitor glanced around the sparse front room. Igor not see very many clothes. Why not more business? Well, you see... Uh, Igor worked as blacksmith, months, Herr Hauptschmidt. Shop always full of jobs needing to be done. Horseshoes, gates, grills, weapons. Yes, well, how very lovely for you. Unfortunately, the people of this fair burg prefer to make, mend, and alter their own apparel, even if it does leave them looking more often not like ruffians and trollops. <laughs> the hideous man rested an arm on the counter and leaned forward, looking more hideous with each approaching inch. So, how you make a living, huh? Klaus's eyes met the man's. <laughs> the stranger's stare was almost hypnotic. In point of fact, I don't. It was Klaus knew a stupid thing to say. He would never get away with charging a steep rate now. But somehow this wily-looking horror had a way of pulling the truth right out of him. My daughter and I are recent arrivals here. Your daughter, yes. <laughs> Igor, see her leave as he come in. She very uh, lovely. Klaus wasn't sure whether to thank the creature or punch him, so he ignored the comment and continued. When my wife passed away, we left Viseria to Viseria? begin. Viseria? You lived there? Taylor's there? We lived there, yes, but I worked at, at the brewery. And I don't even drink beer. I'm an enophile. The man raised a bushy eyebrow. It's uh, none of Igor's business if uh, Taylor happens to like uh, a little... Wine! It means that I am an aficionado of wines <laughs> and of the finer spirits. Yet there I labored, day after endless day, in the village brewery, just as my father did and his father before him. In Klaus's head, the speech continued, and I came home each night smelling of yeast and hops, just as they did in their day, and being called by one and all Hops Schmidt. So you not real, Taylor? Klaus stepped toward him. The next words came shooting out in an ice-cold stream. Let me make one thing clear. I am the most skilled tailor in the entire province, quite possibly in all of Europe. I threaded my first needle at 19 months. I took my first measurement the very day that I learned to count. Over the years, I came to outfit many of this nation's most notable men, why I have clothed the Kaiser himself. But all of this I did on the side, a hobby, as it were, until my wife's untimely demise seven months ago. In the wake of that tragedy, and in the spirit of life is short so carpe diem, I handed in my brewing apron and sold our house, and my daughter and I moved here to begin our lives anew. As it turned out, the only problem the only fly in the ointment of this my grand life-affirming scheme is that the good people of Kutstadt seem to believe that they would have more use for an igloo builder, or perhaps a narwhal hunter, than they do for a tailor. Klaus caught his breath and placed his small, nimble hands on his slender hips. Now, sir, any questions? Just one. Can you make size, uh... He threw up his hands. Size 6'6", six, six, extra, extra long suit. Klaus eyed him warily. The man before him was no larger than he, and stood shorter thanks to a crooked neck and slightly punched back. I can, but frankly, you'd be swimming in it. It's not for me, it's for friend. <laughs> well, then your friend will have to come in for a fitting. No! I'm sorry, it's the only way can, we can assure that the... No! The counter shook under the loud thud of the would-be customer's fist. He no can come, he, uh, busy. <laughs> Listen here, sir. If I'm to do a job, then I must do it right. 
That means an initial fitting before I can begin, then a second fitting once the suit is in process for alterations. Two fittings, one suit. No fittings, no suit. Klaus's tough customer gave this some thought, then smiled. It was a jagged tooth, horrible smile. Igor make you deal. Von fitting. You tailor man, make size 66 XX long suit. Then Igor bring friend in for uh, alterations. Klaus paused, considering, but then shook his head. No, I'm sorry. Tell me, Herr Hofschmidt, you in any position to turn down paying customer? A valid point, but I've yet to see any pay. Igor, no have money with him now. Ah, uh, yes, nor anything of value for collateral, I'm certain. Oh, yes. Klaus paused, his curiosity peaked. He turned back to see the old unsavory pulling from his deerskin pouch a shepherd's horn. It was, in shape and design, unusual, weird even, but hardly a treasure. This crooked neck, this crude shofar, you offer me as collateral? It's no chauffeur. Horn no drive Igor around town. <laughs> it's prize possession. It's instrument it has fingers, finger holes. It's my prize possession. And from the look on the other's face, the tailor knew he was telling the truth, in which case he would indeed come back to claim and pay for his order. Klaus drummed his fingertips atop the counter. You want I should play the tailor? Oh, no, 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 don't, please. The tailor snapped up the horn, weighing it in his hands. And when you return, you you will have money. Oh, yes. Igor know where to get, uh, where to earn lots of money, fast. Very well. Klaus tucked the horn on a shelf behind the counter. From the same shelf, he then pulled out a thick leather-bound sample book and set it down heavily on the countertop. You must choose a color. Black. Klaus flipped the book to the middle, and the fabric. The best. Klaus peered at him, then flipped over to a new page. This tightly woven blend offers durability and heft. It also breathes exceedingly well. The fabric breathes? It's alive? <laughs> Igor, Igor placed an ear to the sample, listening. That is an expression. It means that your uh, friend won't get too hot. Even when the lightning strike? What? What? Never mind. The crooked man tapped a fingertip against the fabric. Is the best? Yes. Several of our nation's leading lights have worn this very fabric. Dieter Schnabel, the composer and conductor. Moving pictures actor Conrad Veidt. Baron Wolf von Frankenstein. General Otto... Wait, Vaut. wait, what? After Veidt. Veidt, what, Veidt? Excuse me? <laughs> the shaggy man stepped forward. What you say after Veidt? Uh, Baron Frankenstein? The other nodded, chuckling softly to himself. His voice, when next he spoke, was likewise low. Yes, we use this cloth. It's good enough for our Frankenstein. It's good enough for my friend. Very well. Klaus picked up a small notepad and pen. And what is your name? Name, Igor. Klaus could have guessed, but with this strange creature, it was hard to be sure. Meticulously, the tailor began to print. Igor, capital R. Not I. Not you, then, then who? No, it's Igor with a Y. Why? Why? Igor not no Y, because Igor's mother spell it that way. Klaus blinked twice, then resumed printing. Igor, Y, G. Igor already tell you Y, and what you say G for? You surprised? Oh. Ah, so now you understand, uh, you say O. R, you. Is Igor what? Losing patience? Yes, Igor losing patience, and do not ask why. For some reason, Klaus found himself recalling an American comedy duo he'd seen in a film <laughs> at Der Munich Movie House. He shook off the thought and made another notation on the form and then said, size 66XX long jacket and the waist? 48. In scene? 50. Lucky for you, this fellow is your friend. One would hate to have him as an enemy. Yes, Von Wood. <laughs> Taylor looked over the figures before him and shook his head. This job's going to be a real monster. Then set down his pen and ripped, yes, I know. <laughs> You're right. You're absolutely right. Ripped it, that was my line. That wasn't Greg's. Full response. Ripped the top two sheets off his pad and handed over the carbon copy. Igor stared down at the estimated price. Is a lot of money, huh? Is a lot of fabric, huh? One week, Mr. Igor. Too slow. We need sooner. Very soon. Well, you'll pay extra for it. Double that price and you can have it in three days. And if Igor were to, uh, triple the price? Klaus could barely contain his excitement. It would be a long night, but it would be worth it. This time tomorrow. It's good. Triple 
And not I'm Fenigless? Yes, yes, Igor will pay. Then the strange figure turned and left the shop, muttering something to himself as the door slammed behind him. Something that, to Klaus's dismay, sounded very much like... And Taylor Man, he will pay too. Oh. <laughs>